Lumbar punctures can be one of the most frustrating and difficult procedures to do in the hospital because it remains essentially a blind procedure. But in this video, I want to share 10 key tips for you to improve your success rate at getting lumbar punctures. So tip number one is to avoid starting too low. Let's first do a quick review of the anatomy of a lumbar puncture. So of course, we use the posterior superior iliac crest to uh, be our landmark, and this lines up with the posterior spinous process of L4. And in general, what we're taught is to target the interspinous space between L3 and L4, or L4 and L5. The reason is because the spinal cord generally ends around L1 to L2, and so if you go at that level, you may cause some spinal cord injury. So we're taught to go pretty low. But one of the things that I think myself and many other trainees and residents and attendings do is we tend to cheat to, by going too low and favoring the L4, L5 interspace, sometimes maybe even accidentally going L5, S1. And the problem with that is that these interspaces down here are actually much smaller than the higher up interspaces such as L3, L4, and even L2, L3. On top of that, the spinous processes for L1 and L2 are generally much more prominent and so it can help you stay midline if you're targeting something higher. So in general, I would say I previously was targeting L4, L5, but now I think uh, for most people, it would be beneficial if you actually aim one interspace higher, targeting L3, L4. Maybe you'll accidentally go to L2, L3, but if you target that L3, L4, you still have a pretty safe uh, leeway where it's going to be very difficult for you to go so high that you're going to injure the spinal cord. And I was actually kind of curious how often spinal cord injury happens as a result of lumbar puncture. And I actually didn't find any strict numbers on it, just on my brief search, but I did see this one case report here where they were actually targeting L1 to L2 for uh, spinal anesthesia for a C-section, and then they eventually did T12 to L1, and this patient did uh, experience some uh, weak lower extremity weakness, some pain that persisted for three to six months. They were treated with steroids, but they eventually did make a fairly good recovery. Um, but you know, these people are going very, very high up L1, L2, T12, L1. So again, we have quite a bit of leeway if you're targeting L3, L4 rather than L4, L5. So again, don't start too low and try to target up higher because you're going to have a higher success rate. You can see on Reddit that multiple people talk about how L3, L4 often has a higher success rate. So I usually start with L4, L5, but L3, L4 is often easier. L3, L4 space will almost always give you a better chance of success than L4, L5. You're probably going a space lower than you realize. L4, L5 space is quite difficult to get because of the angle of the spinous processes. And L5, S1 is even more difficult. L3, L4, on the other hand, is a piece of piss, so make sure you know what level you're actually at. They beat into us that if we go too high, we can hurt a patient, which has led to most novices I see going way too low at the S1, S2 level. Go higher. Tip number two is to make sure the patient's shoulders and their hips are parallel to each other. You don't want them to be lying in the left lateral decubitus position and one shoulder be more forward or backwards compared to the other or same thing with the hips because this uh, introduces a sort of rotation to the spine, which is going to make it very, very difficult for you to maintain midline. And this is a good uh, website right here where it actually shows this patient um, right here has their uh, shoulder kind of... Uh, inched backwards a little bit and you can see how this twists the whole spine and really causes your midline to be a lot more difficult to follow uh, whereas if the hips are parallel to the bed and the shoulders are parallel everything is in a straight line it's much much more difficult for you to lose your midline in that situation in general positioning is incredibly uh, important for this procedure you really want to spend a majority of your time making sure the positioning is good and everything is set up adequately uh, because that's really going to be the biggest determining factor on whether you're going to get the CSF or not. Tip number three is to consider doing an upright lumbar puncture. Now, in general, a lateral decubitus lumbar puncture has an advantage over an upright because you can immediately check the opening pressure. Whereas with an upright, uh, I did read some people would do an upright and then have the patient lie down and then they could check the opening pressure, but that obviously adds a pretty big step there. Um, and also a lot of times your patients are not gonna be able to sit upright in this position. Sometimes they're gonna be kind of altered or something and you're gonna be having to do it in the left lateral decubitus position. So it's probably better to practice with left lateral decubitus. That being said, if you really need to get the lumbar puncture and you wanna improve your success rate, I do think considering an upright lumbar puncture is a good idea. 
idea because uh, it's actually, I find that patients are able to open their interspaces a little bit better when they're upright. And also it really, really helps you stay midline because there's none, none of those torsion or rotational forces that you're going to be seeing uh, sometimes when patients are on a bed. And it really makes it come down to like two axes instead of three axes that you're targeting. And it makes it easy to stay in the midline. So I've had a much higher success rate personally with upright lumbar punctures, but I do know the downsides of the lumbar puncture. Again, not being able to check the opening pressure and not being able to do it in some patients. Here's a quick example of a person in left lateral decubitus versus upright and you know even upright I can already just visually see the spinous processes here and you can see how upright could honestly be a lot easier to stay midline and even just you know visually be able to see the spinous processes compared to lateral decubitus. Tip number four is to draw your landmarks very liberally. Get those surgical markers and honestly if you have to draw a huge line down the patient's back to keep track of where midline is that is totally fine to do and don't be embarrassed to do that because if it improves your success rate, it uh, improves the comfort for the patient by getting it earlier and not having to struggle a bunch with the procedure, then it's totally, totally worth it. So here you can see an example of uh, somebody really marking out their spaces very clearly. So they mark out their midline, their L3, L4 space, their L4, L5 space, and you can even extend this high, high up if you want to because you can. it's much easier to palpate the uh, spinous processes up here and then that really helps you uh, remember what's in the midline. So use that marker very, very liberally. In patients who are obese and it's difficult to palpate their landmarks, whether that be their iliac crests or just their spinous processes, consider using an ultrasound. So in this case, an ultrasound can be very helpful because you can see it can really quickly identify where the spinous processes are. You can see these very dark uh, places where the ultrasound waves are not passing through. And uh, that can help you mark out where the spinous processes are and it'll really help you uh, go in the interspace. The next tip, number six, is to actually ask the patient if you are in the midline or if you're in the center. Patients actually have a really good sense of whether you are touching in the middle of their back or not, and they can really help guide you, especially when it's difficult to palpate their landmarks. So really, just don't forget to use them as a resource. It can be very helpful for you when you're actually drawing out everything, just asking them, hey, does it feel like I'm in the center here? Tip number seven is to just use more local anesthesia. A lot of times those kits that uh, at least I have at my institution, they just come with five milliliters of lidocaine. Really just be very liberal and just give a lot of uh, you know analgesia because it's gonna make the procedure more comfortable for the patient. There's gonna be a lower risk that you know they're feeling pain and want to abort the procedure. And it gives you a little bit more time to get the CSF because they're, you're keeping up their comfort levels higher. Tip number eight is to use your patient's pain to redirect your needle. So if a patient starts feeling pain radiating, radiating down their right leg, then redirect your needle slightly left. And if they're feeling it vice versa on the left side, redirect your needle slightly to the right. That's because you're probably hitting some nerves over on the left side. It means you're off the midline. You need to redirect in the opposite direction of the pain that they're feeling. Tip number nine, and this is a big one. There's a really, really good um, video on this, but it's know what the patient's bone is telling you. Now, if you're hitting bone early versus in the middle versus late, or if you're not hitting bone at all, these all tell you different things about what you're hitting on the patient's anatomy and how you should adjust your needle um, in order to get into the interspinous space. So I'm going to link this video down in the description below, but this was a very, very helpful video that I found, but it's titled what to do when the needle encounters the bone during spinal or lumbar puncture. And he goes through all the different scenarios and I'm actually going to play a, a part of it for you because it's very helpful just graphically be able to see it as well. In an ideal scenario, the needle would never encounter any osseous structures, but when it does, you must stop and ask yourself a question, which bony structure is on the way of the needle now? There are four typical scenarios. Scenario number one, the needle touches the bone superficially. When that happens, what that means is that we are in the midline, but not in the interspace. The course of action is take the needle out and do not reposition by reorienting cephalad or laterally. Rather, take the needle completely out of the skin and reinsert the needle one centimeter up or one centimeter down to place the needle in the interspace. Scenario number two, the needle enters and touches the bone deeper at about two to four centimeter deeper. What that really means is 
that we are not in the midline, rather that we are paramedial one side or the other, and the needle is now touching the lamina. In this case, we need to withdraw the needle to the skin and do what I call micro directions laterally one side, laterally the other side, or slightly cranially. But again, the key word here is micro directions one side the other side or slightly cranially never caudally because the needle can never enter the intrathecal space if you reorient your needle caudally scenario number three is when the needle enters up to six to eight centimeters and touches bone most of these situations in my clinical observations the practitioners are now desperate and they tend to abandon the procedure and take the needle out but in fact, if you touch the bone at six to eight centimeters distance, what that really means is that you have missed the dural click. You were in a correct position, but you missed the dural click and you passed through the subarachnoid space. What you need to do is pull the needle back by one centimeter and watch for the CSF to show up at the hub of the needle. Scenario number four is where the needle enters all the way to the hub and you do not get any bone contact. In many of these scenarios, the operators tend to think that the needle is too short and they request for a longer needle, whereas in fact, they are paramedial without knowing it. They miss the midline and they have inserted the needle into the psoas muscle and they are edging towards the abdominal cavity. The course of action is take the needle out completely and then reassess for the midline. Keep these four scenarios in mind every time you do spinal anesthesia or lumbar puncture. And if you do, I guarantee you that you will become a lot better at spinal and lumbar puncture and you will end up helping others instead of asking for help. And so yeah, that's a fantastic video. I highly urge you guys to check it out. But remember, hitting bone early, you're probably hitting the spinous process. So reposition uh, your needle one centimeter up or down. Uh, scenario two, you're hitting it kind of in the middle somewhere. You're probably hitting the, the lamina, which means you were off the midline. So do micro redirections laterally and caudally to uh, get into the interspace. And scenario number three, this happened to me recently. I actually felt a loss of resistance and then I kept going and I was really, really deep before I started hitting bone and no CSF was coming. And at that point, we had already been trying for quite a while on the patient, so we just kind of gave up, and I just removed the needle after we didn't get anything. But really, if, you in, if you're in that scenario, just slowly withdraw the needle and see if you get that CSF back, because at that point, you've probably already entered the space, you just are a little bit too far, and you need to come back slightly. And then scenario number four, not hitting anything at all, Again, that means you're just totally, totally off the midline. Don't ask for a longer needle. Even in very, very obese patients, you know, there's only so much fat that people can have in, in the back here. 90 plus percent of the time, it's not going to be an issue of the needle length. It's going to be an issue of you being off the midline. So refine your uh, structures. Consider getting an ultrasound if you need to really figure out where you are and uh, go in once you're at midline. All right, and the last tip that I wanna give you, tip number 10, is to consider a paramedian approach or a lateral approach if your patient has significant arthritis or osteophytes. So this is a technique uh, that's actually done, um, that's actually reviewed by the same guy, uh, Dr. Hadzik. And basically he talks about how uh, if you're running into a lot of ossified structures, ossified ligaments, you can actually go in through this lateral approach and it can get past a lot of those uh, osseous structures. Um, and so what you do is you actually target a little bit lower. So this, in this case, you actually go for L5, S1, S1, S2. And uh, you just go about a centimeter off uh, the midline and then you just direct your needle in from that direction. I'll also link this video down below because it's a really interesting video and also gives you a really good look at the anatomy of how he's targeting this with the paramedian approach. And I've seen a couple of video, other videos talk about this as well, so definitely something for you to consider. Oh yeah, and quick bonus tip. Uh, I totally forgot about this one until I just checked right now, but um, uh, there is this study that was actually done with resonant lumbar punctures, and one of the techniques that actually improved 
resonant success with lumbar punctures was early stylet removal. So early removal of the stylet improved success rates with an odds ratio of 2.4. This was done in pediatric patients, so in infants, but I think it could be applied to adults as well. The stylet, you know, we we're taught that you should remove it and then check for CSF and put it back in, advance, remove it, check for CSF. I still think that is the correct way to do it, but um, you can consider early removal once you think you're near the CSF and uh, it actually can help improve your success rates. The downsides of it is that it could increase the risk of your needle getting clotted off either with like a skin plug or with blood, but you can consider removing the stylet early and just kind of moving back and forth a little bit just to see if you're, you know, maybe near the space. And so, yeah, another thing for you to consider. With these tips, I hope you guys are excited to try your next lumbar puncture. It's become very difficult uh, as a hospitalist, as a trainee, as a resident, the opportunities to do lumbar punctures do seem to be a lot less than they used to be. You know, there's so much more specialty care. A lot of these lumbar punctures we're sending to radiology to do or neurology to do. And uh, so the opportunities are less, but I, I think with a good understanding of how the bone is telling you, you know, how you're off, you know, how to position the patient correctly and going for a little bit of a higher target. I think those are really some of the key tips that are really gonna improve your success rate. And I, I'm excited to try my next lumbar puncture. And I hope you guys are as well, because it is a very satisfying procedure once you do get it. Lastly, I do want to pose a couple of questions to you guys. So what do you guys think about the rising trend of these lumbar punctures being deferred to neuroradiology or neuroradiologists and hospitalists kind of losing the skill? Is this something that hospitalists should, you know, be giving up because uh, neuroradiology has a higher success rate? Um, or is this something that really is important for hospitalists to still maintain? And, you know, it, you know, you can do it right away instead of having to contact them and then having to wait for them to schedule, things like that. So I'm very curious to hear about your guys' opinion on that new trend. And then finally, if you are a neurologist, an anesthesiologist, a neuroradiologist, or just anybody who does a lot of lumbar punctures in general, please let us know down in the comments below what your best tips are and what has helped you have the most success. What do you think would be most helpful for people to know? Very curious to hear what you guys think. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.